Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Retro Room. It's time again for Septandy, a month where we take some time to focus, spotlight, and even honor and celebrate the great computingness that was brought to us by Tandy and Radio Shack. I personally am a big fan of their portables, everything from the PC machines all the way to the Model 100s. And today we're going to be taking a look at one particular piece of the Model 100 technology. That is the portable disk drive. This video is one I've been promising for a while. We're going to do a belt replacement on a Tandy portable disk drive. And we're going to look at the disassembly procedure for the TPDD2 and the TPDD1. These are storage options for the Tandy 100 family of laptop computers. This PDD2 in the box needs a little bit of maintenance, so we're going to get inside and take a look. We're going to start with the PDD2. I've never actually seen the retail box for this drive, so this is kind of cool. Let's get this box open. This job is for a fellow I've done some work for before, and I think he's included the replacement belt that this drive needs. But here in the top layer, you can also see the original serial cable. This is what connects the drive to the Model 100. And sure enough, here's the replacement belt. It's an FRW 8.5. And pretty much every TPDD is going to need this belt replaced by this point. Getting inside here, we get to the actual disk drive. And right away, we can see that the power switch is in the on position. You can see the little red indicator showing. Uh, when the switch is in the uh, off position, the down position, nothing shows. And you flip it back up to on, and you see the little red indicator through the window. Luckily, there are no batteries installed. So always make sure that you ship these things without the batteries installed in case the switch gets turned on in shipping and you do not want a battery leakage disaster. Also inside the drive, we can see that there's a disk still in it. We'll take a look at this once we get the drive working again, see if there's anything on it. The first thing we need to do, though, is get this drive connected to a computer so that we can give it a test and assess its functionality. I fully expect to discover that it's going to need a new belt at least. So we'll get our 102 laptop here and the serial cable. This DB25 end will connect to the laptop itself. And this other end will plug into the pins on the back of the portable disk drive. You see there's a notch here at the top that indicates the correct orientation of the plug. And of course, the serial port on the Model 102 is upside down compared to the 100, but that's okay. And we'll get this connected in here to these pins. It's a little bit of a fiddly fit. And to power the drive, we're going to use one of the original Tandy 100 power supplies. It's voltage and pin and polarity compatible, so we can just plug it right in. I'm powering the laptop from AA's right now. So we'll put our mystery disk into the drive. And we're going to start up TS-DOS. I have that running from Rex on my computer. And we hit F4. And sure enough, that telltale sound right there is the sound of a drive motor spinning, but completely uncoupled to the disk mechanism. And you can hear it again. So definitely we need to get in there and get this belt replaced. Like I said, this is exactly what I was expecting to find. The portable disk drive 1 and 2 are held together by 6 screws. 2 in the front, 2 in the middle, 2 at the back. The 2 in the front here hold the faceplate on. To get the top cover off the drive, all we want to do right now is remove these 2 screws at the back and that will allow us to hinge the cover up and just take a look at the mechanism. These screws feel like they have definitely not budged since they were installed at the factory, so I'm certain that no belt replacement has ever been done to this drive. Here's what the case screws look like. All six screws on the portable disk drives, both one and two, are the same length, so you don't have to worry about mixing up which one goes in which hole. We'll just put these in our little parts bin, make sure I don't lose them on my bench. 
and at this point you can just lift the top cover right off of the drive. Let's get this disc out of the drive and then take a peek, see if we can see any evidence of the belt, but it's not really able to see anything because of the drive here. So we'll have to remove the actual drive frame. To remove the drive mechanism, we're going to start by removing the two screws at the front that are securing the plastic face panel to the drive. And then right away, we can see our first piece of the deceased belt. It's just kind of stuck to the plastic right here. So we're going to get some tweezers and just pick this piece off here. I don't want to touch it with my fingers because by now this rubber has deteriorated to the point that it's just going to disintegrate on everything that it touches, and I'd rather have it do it on the tweezers than on my fingers. Here's another piece that just fell out onto my bench. And then these last set of screws actually hold the drive frame into the plastic case. The last thing we need to do before we can remove the drive mechanism is to get the power supply board detached from the plastic case because it's going to have to move a little bit so that we can disconnect it. The power supply is held in place by two small screws aided by a couple of white plastic cups, so make sure you don't lose them. Now that the power supply has a little bit of room to move, we can lift the drive mechanism out of the plastic case. And one very nice feature of the PDD-2 is that the power supply cable uses a connector to connect to the drive board. And this allows us to easily disconnect the drive from the power supply and makes servicing it much, much easier. Now we can set aside the power supply board in the case and focus on the drive mechanism. And we can see a large piece of the old belt still adhered to the flywheel. And we can also see some evidence of battery leakage here on this shield. At some point someone left some alkaline batteries in this drive for too long and they leaked out probably into the case and onto this shield. So we'll need to see if we see any further evidence of damage from that. To remove the controller board, remove the three screws on top of the shield. And then there's one more screw hidden underneath the shield, for a total of four screws on the controller. This flat flex cable connects the sensors on the drive to the controller board and needs to be removed before we can get the controller board sufficiently out of the way to deal with the belt. This connector has a tab to release it. Don't try to pull out the flex without releasing this tab first. Oh, and also, try not to drop the drive mechanism onto your workbench. Now we just want to take our tweezers and pick out all the little tiny bits of belt that are all over this drive. It's an annoying process because the pieces break really easily and don't like to peel off in one piece. And the same with the piece on the flywheel. We just want to peel this as slowly and carefully as we can and try and get all the rubber off. Here I was able to slide the tip of the tweezers underneath the belt and get this last bit off in one piece. You can see here the rotting rubber has left a gray mark on the flywheel. We'll hit it with alcohol, but the stain is probably permanent. And this rust spot here might be more evidence of battery corrosion. It looks like we've gotten all the belt pieces off of the controller, 
and luckily I'm not seeing any evidence of battery damage on the PCB, so I think we dodged a bullet there. Back on the motor pulley, this part of the belt is really rotted and isn't pulling off the pulley like the rest of it, so we'll have to get a lot of this off with alcohol. Now we'll just look over the rest of the unit and inside the mechanism. We want to make sure that we got all the belt pieces out so they don't gum up the mechanism or get smeared on the heads or on the disc itself. And these pieces can hide just about anywhere, so you want to make sure you look really carefully. So I think we're good now and we've gotten all the pieces, so we just need to clean the pulley and the flywheel and then install the new belt. To clean them, I'm going to use isopropyl alcohol on cotton swabs. I'm very happy that it's finally possible to order alcohol again. It was impossible to find for a few months. But this is just the best way to get the remains of the rotted rubber off of all the parts. Make sure you go over the pulley and flywheel very carefully to get all the remaining gunk, because you don't want it to adhere to the new belt. And you can see we've got a lot more gunk left on the motor pulley. The best approach with this is to just set it on the ground and turn the pulley while holding the alcohol swab against it. That's looking a lot better, but there's still some more rotted rubber on here to be dealt with, so I'll give it one more swab. And that's looking pretty clean now. Now let's get our replacement belt. Both the TPDD1 and TPDD2 use the same belt. This FRW 8.5 is the correct modern replacement for this belt, and you can get them from eBay or also audio parts distributors. Installing the belt is pretty simple. Start by placing it one end on the motor pulley, and then stretch the belt around the flywheel. I find it helps to rotate the flywheel to sort of guide the belt onto it. You want to make sure that the belt sits below the lip on the flywheel. Sometimes just rotating the flywheel will move the belt off of the lip and onto the flat part of the flywheel. In this case, though, it's not doing the trick and the belt is still riding up on this top lip of the flywheel. So I'll just pull it down a little bit and then rotate it some more to get it sitting properly. And now it's good. With the belt replaced, we can now reinstall the controller board. Remember that when we removed it, we disconnected this flex cable, and reconnecting that flex is going to be the most difficult part of reinstalling this controller. Make sure that the connector on the controller board is open so you can insert the cable, and then guide the cable into it as you bring the controller board up towards the drive frame. Sometimes you'll find it necessary to use tools like pliers or tweezers to get the cable to sit into the connector fully. Just make sure that you're using tools without any sharp edges because you really don't want to rip this flex connector or damage any of the conductors on it. Latch the connector and then give it a gentle tug to make sure that it's in there. In this case, it's not. Once the end of the cable has been inserted into the connector, you'll need to use the stiff plastic part on the end and press it into the connector as far as it'll go to make sure that it's seated properly. Okay, we've got it this time. Before we reattach the controller board, we need to make sure that we're not pinching any of the cables or wires that run to it. 
And then this shield has three holes in it. And those holes go through the shield and the PC board. The fourth hole only goes through the PC board, so we need to install that screw first because we can't get to it through the shield. And there we go. Our drive mechanism is all back together and we're ready to put it back into the frame and reassemble the rest of the drive. So we'll get our bottom case here and reconnect this power connector from the power supply board. And we can just drop the drive frame in here temporarily. What we need to do now is get this power supply board reattached. It has these two screws. And we do need to make sure that we have our cable assemblies aren't being pinched by this spring on the side of the drive. To mount the power supply board, this post goes through a hole in the PCB up to the top where it can have the screw installed. And the rear power supply screw has this plastic cup that it goes into, and that helps keep the board and the shield in place. The front screw is just a bare screw by itself. And now we have enough of the drive reassembled that we can test it and make sure that the belt replacement actually fixed the problems. And magically we have the PDD2 connected up to the machine. We have the power from the AC adapter, serial cable up to the Tandy 102, and we're going to use TS-DOS to give this drive a test. Would help if we put a disk in the drive. Now this is just a random floppy that we found in the drive when we got it, so who knows if it's formatted or if it has any contents. We'll press F4 to read the disk. And there it is, it's reading a 200 kilobyte disk. It's a blank disk, nothing interesting, but all indications are that the drive is working. We we'll hit it again, and we can see the access light running. So now the next test is going to be to reformat this disk, and that will exercise the whole mechanism of the drive and make sure that everything is working properly. But I can only do that if the right protect is off. We'll hit F5. And we'll tell it yes to format. And now we wait. If we zoom in here, you can probably see the head starting to step through the tracks as it formats the disk. That's all looking good. The disk format process is incredibly slow and boring, so we'll speed this up. Back to real time now, it's retracting the head to the beginning of the disk, and we get a communication error. Now this error confused me for a little while, but ultimately I determined that it basically means the format failed rather than an actual communication error. So this probably just indicates that the disk is bad. So let's eject this disk, and just in case, we're going to get some alcohol on a swab and clean the head. There's only one, because this is a single-sided drive. The head doesn't look dirty, so I'm not expecting this to change anything. And I'm just going to go ahead and use a brand new old stock double density disk. Now it's reporting that the disk's not formatted, so we will go ahead and format it. Again, speed this up. And now it's happy. So whatever random disk this came with was bad. Now let's go ahead and try and write some files to this new disk. Back with some test files loaded into RAM. 
This is Creative Computing's sign program, and this is Starblaze, a really incredible Defender clone for this machine. So we'll select it, press the Save key, enter to use the same file name, and it's writing it to the disk. Okay, no errors. Let's go over here and save Starblaze the same way. Head stepping this file slightly larger. And it appears it was successful. Now we can press F4 to look at the disk, and the files are there. I think we've got a good drive, so we can go ahead and turn everything off and put the case back on. To reassemble the drive, we're going to start by reattaching the drive frame to the plastic case using the two front screws. And I'm noticing that both my hands on the bottom of the drive are covered with deteriorated belt. So we're going to grab our alcohol and some swabs here and just take that off real quick. This goo comes off really easily with just a quick brush with isopropanol. Reattaching the front panel is a bit trickier due to these plastic control inserts. For the power switch, you want to make sure that the red indicator is on the bottom and that the switch is in the downward position since our power switch is off. And the eject button has a larger chin on the bottom as well. So next, I'm going to use a couple pieces of masking tape to hold the buttons in place from the front so that they don't fall out during reassembly. When applying the tape, make sure not to cover the holes for the LEDs. There's a low battery light and an access light. And that's these two LEDs right here. They need to go through those holes that we left open in the tape in front. The alignment of the LEDs can be a little bit tricky. and You might have to coax the low power light into its hole. Here I'm just using my pair of tweezers to gently push that LED down so that it enters the hole in the front cover. Once the panel is seated properly, secure it with the two frontmost screws, and then you can remove the masking tape. And check that the switches are operating properly, and this looks good. Now we can reinstall and reattach the top cover, place the front tabs underneath that black front cover, and then lower the back side of the case down. It can sometimes be a little bit tricky to get the front tabs engaged correctly so that the top cover closes properly. There we go, now it's in place, and we can secure it with the final two screws. And there we have it, our drive is back together again. So let's just connect it back to the laptop for one final test. Again, power from our AC adapter, the serial cable with the notch on the top, and then the DB25 connected to the serial port on the Tandy 102. We'll reinsert our test disk from before, and press F4 to read the disk. And there we are, sign.ba and star16.co are present. Real quick before we go, I just wanted to show the difference on the PDD-1, the original portable disk drive. The case is open the same way, but once you get in, you'll find that the power supply on the PDD-1 is permanently connected to the drive's controller board, so you can't disconnect it for servicing. There's also this small bit of copper tape 
connecting the metal shield to ground. So the only way you can get the drive frame out for servicing is to dismount the power supply board entirely, and I also recommend removing the front power switch assembly to give you a little bit more room to get that drive frame free and work on it. Other than that, the procedure is the same, and it takes the exact same belt. Well, that's about it for this video. Thanks for watching. I encourage all of you to check out the other channels participating in Septandi. I'll have links down in the description. And thanks for hanging out with the biggest name in small computers.